Hi, this is Lisa Kelly, Notre Dame author and class of 1993, and you are watching the Two Irish Brothers Show. Cheers and go Irish! How's it going, everyone? I am ND Sean 45. I'm Irish Benjamin 57. And together we are the two Irish brothers. Ben, the Irish did it. They have completed an undefeated regular season. Granted, we were supposed to have Wake Forest this week, but the ACC called that one off. So, the third time in Brian Kelly's tenure that he has led this team to an undefeated regular season. Yep. And, uh, What's the uh, icing on the cake? It is, didn't lose a single conference game. Hmm. Not yet. Well, not yet. We still, we still got to play the championship okay. game. Well, okay, let's, let's just pathetically, let's say hypothetically we lose to Clemson. Okay, that means we lost one conference game that's technically a championship, technically, in our season. And what did the quote-unquote haters say that we would go – 50-50 in our conference games. Yeah, they always that people always have said that if we were in a conference, we would never do well. Like you said, we would go 500, maybe barely over 500, but we would never be at the top. We certainly wouldn't win the conference. Um, so we proved a lot of people wrong to this point in the season. But of course, it's not over yet. But still, though, at, th at this point in the season, going 10 and 0 and undefeated in. Uh, conference play in the regular season that's impressive yep so yep. so yep. nobody's gonna nobody's gonna take that accomplishment away from us because i know a lot of people you know are making the excuses and whatnot but enough of that enough of that garbage i'm not even gonna go there it's not worth the it's not worth the breath but so break let's get straight to the game here irish win this one by a final score of four, 45 to 21 um so we were in the ballpark with uh, with my score prediction. I think I said we'd put up forty nine points. Yeah, I think you were. I think you did. But the only problem is Syracuse put up more than I thought. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know. I know my. They put up a lot more than I thought. If it says anything, so. Yeah, you had a you had a goose egg. I think I had ten. Yeah. So I I know Eric, my buddy Eric is gonna hate me saying that, but I'm not I'm not trying to dog Syracuse, but just they haven't been playing very well this year. It's been a, a you go one season. and ten. I mean that's their final record. I mean you don't even make a bowl game. That's you know, I mean yeah exactly. You know statistics don't lie. So yeah. So, so getting straight into the game here and getting the the negative part out of the way, like I usually like to do. Um was a rough start to this game and it went well into the second quarter. Um, but we, uh, on both sides of the ball, we looked very flat coming out. And at times the orange were kind of having their way with us. And that was very concerning and very alarming to me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I think, I, I think that Notre Dame and the fans, us fans, didn't give Syracuse enough credit coming into the game. Um, this is a Syracuse team that has bullied and given Clemson all that they can handle the last few years. So to me, was I surprised? I wouldn't say I was like surprised, but it didn't legit shock me either that Syracuse did what they did in this game. Well, and I'll say this, um, when, when Eric and I were doing our live stream of the game uh, on Saturday on this channel, he did bring up a good point, and even, and even I understand this too, and I, I knew this as well, but when you have a team like Syracuse who only has one win coming into this game, they're not going to a postseason bowl game as you mentioned earlier, they're going to throw out all the stops and just give, you know, give the top dog everything they have and everything that they can handle. Yeah, and and I mean, let's remember too, you know, if you want to compare team to team, Syracuse put up 21 points against Clemson this season. Just saying. So, I mean, they can do what they want from time to time. Well, I mean, you know, putting up, 
putting up 21 against us and 21 against Clemson, that's nothing to scoff at. You know, that's 42 points against two very, very big top five teams. Well, and you look at their you look at their schedule and you look at the games that they played. I mean, this this is a team that's a few plays away from being a four, possibly a five win team and could possibly be on their way to a bowl game right now, but just, you know, they didn't have all the breaks go their way, and that just, you know, that just uh, happens when a team is struggling. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you know, like you said, the negative aspect, uh, you know, Notre Dame will get the gripe that they should have done more and better against Syracuse, you know, and in a way, there people are correct about that, but... Like you said, and like your buddy Eric said, when you got nothing to lose and you throw out all the stops, this is what happens. So, I mean, you know, Syracuse showed that they weren't going to just lay o- lay down and roll over. They took it to Notre Dame, and it showed. But Notre Dame weathered that storm, as they've done all season thus far, and came away with the victory. Well, I, I think the, the the main thing that myself and along with a lot of the other uh, uh, panicked people in our fan base, because, you know, of course, I'm keeping tabs on, you know, all the Notre Dame pages during the game. And, yeah, you know, people are people are panicking nonstop during that, that first quarter and a half. And, you know, saying, like, they're freaking out. They're like, oh, what's going on? We're in trouble. We're... We're going to lose this game. We're going to blow it. Every, everything's going wrong. And it's like, calm down. We got a lot of game to, game to play yet. But I, I, I think what a lot of people are getting, we're freaking out over is the slow start. And there's no denying. When, you, when you're a team that's the number two team in the country and you're getting off to a slow start like that, I mean... All, it seems like all the negative things pop into your mind. Like, man, what if this was against you know another top team like like Clemson or Alabama or Ohio State or whoever? You know, right. mo- another another top dog is going to take advantage of that slow start, and that'll come back to kill you in the end. But at the same time, though, at the same time, later that night, watching Clemson and Virginia Tech. The same thing happened there. Virginia Tech was giving Clemson all they could handle, and it was a tight game for quite a while until the end when Clemson started to pull away. So similar thing happened in that game as well. So is it something to pay attention to? Yes, but I think a lot of people in the Notre Dame fan base, myself included, probably read a little too much into that. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, that's what us fans do. I mean, we look too far into stuff. I mean, you know, I would say a lot of fans played football and they played in games that were closer than they probably should have been, you know, in high school. And maybe some of the fans played college ball at a, at a lower level than what Notre Dame is in D1. But, I mean, it happens. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I mean, everybody that's big has a game or two every season for the most part that they struggle in. I mean, and they struggle at times and it happened in Syracuse against Syracuse. Oh, let, but, me, let me tell you a quick story about, about an example of what you're talking about. Of course, I, I've said it many times. I grew up in a small town uh, called G- uh, Geneseo, Illinois, and uh, the local high school team is uh, the Geneseo Maple Leafs. Or otherwise, our nickname was the Green Machine because you see us, we look just like the Green Bay Packers. Um, senior day, on my senior year, we were playing. This is when we were in a different conference at the time than what we are now. But um, we play. We we played our our senior day game against a uh, school up the road from us, LaSalle, Peru. This was a team in our conference that we were playing in at the time that had never beaten us at the varsity level, never. And this is a team that we would normally beat by 30, 40, sometimes 50 points every year. Well, this year, LaSalle Peru brought it to us. And it took us stopping them at the goal line with like three seconds left in the game to hold on for the win and the conference championship that year. So, yes, I have played in games like that, and I've seen it firsthand. Yeah, and that's – and and like I said, you know, 
it happens more than I think people are willing to admit, but then people are shocked when it happens, which just kills me. But it is what it is, and at the end of the day, Notre Dame is 10-0, and 0, and now they await Clemson for a chance at the ACC championship title. So yeah, and that's a that's a good news. You know, that's that's all that matters is the Irish offense. They figured it out. Same with the defense. They figured it out. They got their crap together, and they end up winning uh, 45-21, Which at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Yep. Um, so it didn't hurt them. It just, but it's something you have to think about in, in the the coming weeks. But let's let's break this game down. I mean, obviously, it was the second quarter where things. Uh, really turned around for us. I mean, granted, we, uh, and I'd be, I'd be, uh, doing my buddy Eric some injustice if I didn't mention this, but I think it all got started with, um, with the, uh, oh, what, there was, a, what was it, a face mask call or a pass interference that, I, I think had, it was a face mask that you're talking about, yeah. It was, it was a bogus call. And even I said it during the live stream that that, that the call was bogus, it was weak. I mean, I'll take it because it went in our favor. I'm always going to take it. But I gotta agree with Eric that uh, that call at the time it was uh, a very lousy call by the officials, and they should have they should have eaten the flag. But... Yeah, it's see, I wish in a way penalties could be like reviewed because some of those things happen so fast in the game that. It looks one way, but it's really another. And in that situation, it was like his hand just barely touched the dude's face mask. And like when you're running with the ball and you dip down a little bit, when somebody goes to tackle you, of course they're going to touch your face mask. And I hope I'm talking about the right call here. I can't remember if it was that or if it was a pass interference or, or what. But yeah, I, Maybe we're on different pages. But, but I mean, even so, even with pass interference. Okay, that kind of stuff should be reviewed. Kind of like how we do, how we how they review targeting. Yeah. You know, and I, I get people gripe and moan and say, oh, well, it'll slow the game down even more and all that. But at the same time, okay, do you want the game slowed down and potentially, like, game-winning or game-losing decisions changed for one team or the other, and it's actually correct? Yeah, Because I've seen things where it looks like a vicious hit or it looks like pass interference, the flag's thrown, and then you watch the replay, and the refs don't see the replay, we do, and clearly it's the wrong call. Yeah. And it really affects the game. Now, of course the argument can be made if, if it's that close of a game, then a call shouldn't make or break you because you should never let that get there in the first place. But... <clears throat> We've seen it in past. Yes. And honestly, I think even without that call, we still would have eventually gotten our crap together and went on to win the game. But there's no denying that that call was definitely a turning point in this game that turned turned things around for us. Because we went on, you know, a tw- we scored 21 unanswered points, went into yeah. halftime with a 24-7 to lead, and that was just, you know, kind of the beginning of the end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Notre Dame did what they had to do, and, you know, their offense continued to do good things. I mean, we had two running backs that hit 100 yards or more in Williams and Tyree. You know, um, it seemed like the two teams running-wise were pretty big mirror images to each other because uh, Syracuse had a guy with seven carries and 114 yards. We had a guy with six carries and 109 yards. They had a guy with 23 carries and 101, and we had a guy with 20 and 110. So, I mean, it was like almost perfect mirror images. Yeah. <laughs> the and, running game. Yeah. And Chris, uh, Chris Tyree hitting it, uh, hitting a 94 yard touchdown run. And we've, that's something that we've seen a lot in recent history is a lot of long touchdown runs. I mean, we saw, you know, Josh Adams with a 90. I, well, I think it was, I think it was Josh Adams, wasn't it? And uh, against Wake Forest at home back in 2000. Yes. Yes. It was Josh Adams, and then I think, uh, uh, who was it that had the 99-yard run at Notre Dame Stadium? Was that Procise or was that Dexter Williams? Uh, I It was one of the uh, one or 
one or the other for sure. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember who. Because we, I think it was. I think it was Pro Size. I think. Okay, because we've had. Because let's see. Because I know Dexter Williams had like a ninety-seven yard touchdown run at Virginia Tech uh, during the uh, the two thousand eighteen season. But we've seen we've seen touchdown runs out of the Irish from. You know, 91, 99, 97, and now a 94, 95 out of Chris Tyree on Saturday. So these long runs uh, out of our running backs, I'm I'm loving what I'm seeing there. I really well, it shows am. that the offensive line is just phenomenal. I mean, it yes. is Notre Dame continuously has had very very impressive offensive lines. So, and that's a good thing. That's a great thing. And that's I think why we're currently sitting at number two in the polls and the undefeated 10 and 0 is the offensive line play so oh yeah kudos to, the, kudos to the big boys up front and when you were talking about not just to jump the topic here but when you're talking about all the the rushing yards that Syracuse had you know that's a little concerning that we're giving up 200 plus yards to a 200 plus rushing yards to a a now one and ten team but at the same time, it kind of goes back to what we were saying about them throwing out all the stops to do whatever they can to pull off the upset. But all I know is, and this is just a fact, we cannot let that happen against Clemson if we want if we want to expect to win the conference championship and get to the playoffs. Yeah, we got to we got to improve here. We got to start yeah. improving and, and stepping up. Because but because hey, we proved against Clemson we can stop we can stop you know. That, that's what doesn't make sense. We hold Travis Etienne to 28 yards when we played Clemson, but here we are giving up 200-plus yards to Syracuse. That, you know, it's like a Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing. Yeah. So I don't really know what to make of that. I I don't know. The only thing I, could, the only thing I can think of is just situation. You know, you know that you have to do it against Clemson. You know that you don't really have to do it against Syracuse. I mean. Well, that's a good point. I hope that that's not the case because that makes us look a little bad. But, you know, I mean, situations are different. And, I mean, you know, I wouldn't say Clemson's a legit rival, but they've definitely started to push up that ladder of, quote-unquote, rivals of Notre Dame. And they're definitely an ACC rival. And I think that th- that game had a lot more intensity and in, ill will towards one another than the game against Syracuse. Oh, well, of course it did. I mean, you're talking number four team against number one, so of course the intensity is going to be there. Absolutely. So it's, you know, I don't know. Like I said, situationally, I, I think it's just different. So, But at the same time, in that game against Clemson, too, you know, that you had DJ Uyungle throw for like 430-some-odd yards against us, but we hold, we hold him on the running game. And here, yeah, and in this game, it was kind of the same thing. 200-plus yards on the ground we give up to Syracuse. But for the most part, we kept them in check uh, in the passing game. 185 yards and only one touchdown, and we picked off Rex Culpe- Culpepper once. So, uh, so yeah, maybe maybe stop focusing more on stopping the pass and not so much run. I don't know. But it's just I guess it's just one of those days where nothing yeah. really makes sense. And that's football for you, man. I mean, sometimes it just doesn't doesn't make sense sometimes. But so let's so let's talk about some some more of the positives with the with uh, the Irish. Now, of course, we covered uh, Kyron Williams and Chris Tyree. Both had you know hundred yards on the ground. Um, Chris Ty- Tyree with a 94, 95 yard touchdown run. Ian Book he got it done on the ground as well, fifty three yards and eight carries with two more touchdowns uh, to his uh, his rushing resume. Um, but let's talk about Ian Book passing the ball. 24-37, 285 yards, three touchdowns, and unfortunately his streak of uh, not throwing a pick came to an end. And, yeah. and something I've noticed with, uh, with Ian Book and his touchdown passes, um, the rece- well, in particular the receivers, um, they all seem to come in bunches to one guy. Uh, what I, from what I've noticed, because all three of his touchdowns were to Javon McKinley, who had a great game, uh, 111 yards on seven catches, three uh, three touchdowns. But then also Ben Skoranek had a nice game, 71 yards on four four receptions. But 
Ben Skoranek, it was him in the game against Pittsburgh who had the, the bunches of touchdowns then. You know, Ian Book threw for three touchdowns that day, and all three of his touchdowns were to uh, Skoranek. And I've noticed that's kind of been a trend this year. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it seems like Ian Book has a has a favorite each game, and he keys in, and for whatever reason, they have a good chemistry, and they get it done. So, but uh, And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm not. I just I do think he does need to spread the ball out a little more and try to, you know, keep keep the uh, defenses guessing of where it's going. But at the same time, if you're if you have a connection that's uh, with one receiver that's rolling that game, stick with it. You know, so it makes yeah. sense. <clears throat> yeah, but I mean, you know, Ian Book has been very impressive this season. I don't think enough people have given him enough credit. Um. Going into this championship game after Syracuse now, Ian Book has 15 touchdowns to two interceptions. I mean, the touchdowns aren't as high as some of the other quarterbacks in the country right now, but the interceptions, anytime you can be under 10 interceptions in a season, and you can, any professional quarterback will say this, Anytime you can be under 10 interceptions in a season, that's a good season for oh, a quarterback. Yeah. That, cause that, that's showing that that's a quarterback who knows how to be smart with the football and, right. and protect it, not do stupid things with it. Right. Now, I mean, if you want to get technical, you know, Ian Book did have a fumble against Clemson. So he has three turnovers to his name to his 15 touchdowns. But still, three. Three. I mean – Really, you know, like you can't, and he's just under three thousand yards passing. So, unfo- I, I, I mean, I, I seriously doubt we're going to see him in the Heisman race because, un- let's, I mean, let's just face it, a lot of the other quarterbacks in in the in you know the FBS like uh, Trask and, uh, um, oh, who's the the kid from uh, Brigham Young? What's his name? Williams? Huh? Williams? The, yes. Well, and all, I'm, all, I'm, all I'm getting at is you got a lot of quarterbacks out there who are putting up numbers, like really sexy numbers, like 30-plus touchdowns to single-digit interceptions. And unfortunately, Ian Book, I don't think, has the amount of touchdowns to match that. But still, though, whether he's in the Heisman race or not, this is a, this is a quarterback who knows how to win. And he just, yeah. and he obviously he proved that with becoming the all time, the all time leader in wins at Notre Dame as a quarterback. Yeah, I mean it's he has done absolutely phenomenal, and people continue to just think that he is, you know, average to below average. And I mean, you can't ask for much more than what Ian Book has done. Other than a na- the nas- than multiple national titles, I mean, that's really the only thing he's missing. Yeah, he. So. Other than that, every game he's playing his guts out. He's leading this team. He's doing the absolute best that he can. Now, has he had a great game every time? No, of course not. But let's face it: a quarterback's not going to throw for three hundred plus yards and you know four or five touchdowns every game. It's just not going to happen. Not even the best have done that. You know, but. All I can say is he's he's definitely not given enough credit for the the good things that he has done, and I still, even into this week, see I still see people in our fan base saying that oh he sucks he's not good this that he's below average, and it's yep. like, what what planet are these people living on? No, he's not freaking Dan Marino or John Elway, but yeah. He's getting the job done. He's doing what he has to do, and people forget. Okay, fine. Only fifteen passing touchdowns. Look at all the touchdowns that he's scored on the ground. So he, yeah. he's contributing. This is this guy is contributing all over the place, and that's where most fans. I mean, even myself included, at times. I mean, I I like think I'm a pretty good fan because I can see a lot of this stuff. Because you know, I I love the game. I I study the game. I do the best that I can. But, um. People got to look deeper than just the numbers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, they're, 
I was listening, you know, it's a different sport, but I was listening to um, a hockey podcast today, and they were talking about guys that were just phenomenal pros. Not like the most flashiest guys in the in the NHL, but just phenomenal pros. Guys that do what they got to do, get the job done, you know, lunch pail mentality. And that's what Ian Book is. Ian Book is the lunch pail mentality. He does what he needs to do to get the, the job done. And he gets the job done, and he does it to the best of his abilities. And he doesn't complain. He doesn't make excuses. He, he takes blame when it needs to be taken you know he even said it after the clemson game yeah i probably shouldn't have continued on i should have you know tucked the ball and 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 fallen down as opposed to running and giving that fumble but that's what Ian book is he is the guy that does what he needs to do to win and he wins yes and that's all you can say at the end of the day the guy is a winner and his record proves that nobody can deny that and like I like I just said, some of these people that say the silly things that they do, I'm just like, what what planet are they living on? Right. And the last thing I want to do is criticize our own fan base, but when you see people say such stupid things, you can't help but address it briefly. Yeah. But, you know, oh, I agree. But I, I totally do. agree. And it's it's funny because the same people that complained about book were the same people that said we had no chance against Clemson. They are the same people that said we wouldn't do well. To get to the ACC championship, we'd have no prayer. They're the same people that, you know, continuously doubt the team, yet the team is undefeated, and you know, you know that they are going around wherever they are, living-wise, wearing Notre Dame apparel, going to the store, bragging about the team, showing off, all that kind of stuff. You know that's what they're doing. And not just Ian Book. But I still hear it to this day. Oh, Brian Kelly sucks as a head coach. He's not a good coach. I'm, I'm like, really? Uh, th- now three undefeated regular seasons. Right. Um, and how many wins below Newt Rockney? Yeah, like five, I think. So I could be wrong. Yeah. I could be wrong, but you know, yeah, and, and, and you know, I, I think the biggest issue these days is the fact that it's all about titles. It's all about winning a title. You know. You can be a team that is knocking on the door every year, and until you win the title, nobody will give you credit. And, and I, that's how it is. And I understand college football is definitely one of those sports that's, a, as my buddy Magnum put it, it's a what have you done for me lately sport. He's right. He's right. It, it's been and, it, and with us at Notre Dame, it's been so long since our last title. People are hungry for one. I mean, yeah. the the. I mean, of course, I, I know these. Obviously, the guys on the team now weren't around in you know '88 and whatnot, but you know they're so freaking hungry to bring it, bring a national title back to this university. Right. Um, I mean, but they go there. Yeah, exactly. You know, to do something that hasn't been done in a long time, to be part of that that quote unquote history, you know, and and it is unfortunately, like you said, it's a situation where it's, what have you done? But it's also, there is so little room for error. Yeah. So it's like, it's not like, it's not like the NFL where if you lose a few games, it's not a big deal. As long as you get in the playoffs, you have a chance. You could, you in could, college football, you lose a couple games. You don't have a chance of getting in the playoffs. Well, hell, in college football, you could win and still be punished because you weren't, yeah. you weren't stylish enough in your victory. We've right. seen that happen and, before too. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think, and, and the thing what people have to remember too, is even though college football is a, what have you done for me lately sport, people are like, well, Brian Kelly didn't win the national championship. Okay. Well, guess what? There's 129 other teams that didn't win it either last year. Right. So it, it's, it's not, it's not easy. I mean, yeah, yeah. You, you can have, you can have a team loaded with five stars. We've seen it happen. A team loaded with five star recruits. They still lose the national title. Yep. But just but all I'm saying is, yeah, you don't you don't want to just settle for losing and say that losing's you know okay. It's not. You don't. Nobody sets out to lose. All I'm saying is, if that does happen, look at all the good things that do happen that these players and Brian Kelly do accomplish. They deserve to be given credit for the good things that they do achieve. And I don't see why it's so hard for people to just why you can't just look at that and give him that at least 
even if it, even if a national title doesn't happen, there's still plenty of good things that do deserve credit. Yeah. Yeah, so. I agree. But the bottom line is this. We came out with a, an impressive win against the Syracuse Orange. 10 and 0 to finish out the regular season in this uh this COVID stricken year. Yep. And now we have our first ever uh conference championship game coming up in 2 weeks against uh in a rematch against the Clemson Tigers. Yep. So of course we're going to we're going to save any talk about that for the week of the game. But you know, considering the circumstances of what all we've had to go through this year with COVID and limited practices. You know, people say, oh, asterisk this, asterisk that. Bullshit. And here's why I say that. It's a, it, it's actually tougher to win a championship in this kind of year than any other year, I think. When you're, when oh, we, yeah, I totally agree. And, and Notre Dame is one of those teams this year that has played the most games you could play. They're not in the Big Ten. They're not in the Pac-12. They're not in, you know, um, these other conferences that are playing only a couple games. Notre Dame played 10 games, was supposed to play 11, going to play 11 with the championship, and then on into the playoffs if they can beat Clemson or if the playoff committee gives them a playoff berth with a loss to Clemson. And the, ele- the ele- that 11th game against Wake Forest, that was the ACC's decision to not go through with that. So, I mean, you know, if, if you want to put an asterisk next to somebody, you can put an asterisk next to, like, Ohio State or, you know, Oregon or something. But Clemson, Notre Dame, Alabama, even a school out of the Big 12, depending on who it is, you can't put an asterisk next to their name. Not this year. You no. know. All- they went through. They went through the fire. They went through the turmoil. They had to quarantine. They had all this stuff, and yet they still went ten and one, eleven and one, whatever you want to say, undefeated. Well, back in the day, ten and eleven games was the norm. Yeah. So so and, so. The thing is, this year the the SEC, the Big Twelve, the ACC, all three equally have my respect. Is yeah. because of those so, three conferences that we had a season this year. Same with um, what's the conference that Cincinnati's in? Oh well, uh, well, I'm not I'm not discrediting those three schools or those three conferences. Yeah, the the American Conference USA and Sun Belt. I'm not I'm not discrediting them. I'm just saying it was it was those three those three Power Five conferences that said, hey, we're playing, and those three right. conferences followed suit. So, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I give respect to those three conferences as well. Right. No, no, I didn't. I'm just saying though, all of those conferences that, you, that you've that you rattled off, are there no – there doesn't get to deserve an asterisk next to their name. None of them. You know, you can put it if, – if, if Ohio State gets in the playoffs and wins the whole thing, then yes – you know, you could put an asterisk next to their name. But if Notre Dame, Clemson, hell, even Cincinnati, you know, if they go all the way and win the national title, there's no asterisk next to their name. No way. No. All the, all, those six conferences that I named, they busted their ass from start to finish, and they, they deserve all the respect in the world because it's because of them we had a season. And then all of a yeah. sudden, you know, the other four that backed out, you know, especially the Pac-12 and the Big Ten, they're like, oh, we'll, wait, wait, we'll play now, we'll play. You know, screw you guys. That's all yep. I'm going to say about that because I don't want to get, you know, too angry and too heated. <laughs> no, it's all right. So I think I think most uh, Irish fans and anybody with a team that is in the other couple uh, Power Five conferences that actually played will agree with you there. Um, you know, so, yeah, it feels good to be 10-0. Um, yeah, we're already approaching the uh, the 34 minute mark here, so probably probably a good time to wrap up. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> so 10 and 0, like you said, uh, another undefeated regular season. The conference, the ACC conference championship coming up. Continue to take it one step at a time. Um, but we finished the regular season with a great win over Syracuse. And all of you guys, if you stuck with us in this episode to this to this point, be on the lookout tomorrow night. Um, we got a little surprise coming for you guys. Yes, we do. And it'll be a lot of fun. Yes. Great discussion. Some discussion you guys have probably heard before and get ready to hear about 
a certain fruit again. But um, we'll we'll just we'll leave it at that. Uh, yes, we but will. but it's a great it's going to be great uh, tomorrow night. So on that note, everyone, I am ND Sean forty five. I'm Irish Benjamin fifty seven. And on that note, as always, we say good night, God bless, and go Irish. Go Irish.